Um, tonight, we have um, some return guests, so I don't have to go through the introductions, but Dr. Steinberger is uh, our director of minimally invasive spine surgery, and he'll be talking to you about intradural tumors. If he's able to join us, Dr. Caridi will, join, will jump in for the rest, but otherwise, um, Dr. Steinberger will finish up the talk since uh, Dr. Caridi is stuck in the operating room at the moment. Um, but yeah, with that, uh, Jeremy, go ahead, take it away. Thanks, Pete. Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. So, hi, everybody. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about intradural tumors. Um, and Caridi was going to talk about spine metastases. And uh, he did send me his talk. So, um, I'll go through my talk and then I'll, I'll touch on his talk too. And if he finishes his case and he has time, he'll jump in and he'll give the, uh, he'll give the spine metastases talk. So, I'll talk about intradural tumors. I kept it fun and interactive and uh, throw out questions at any point. And, um, uh, I kept the didactics to a minimum and lots of pictures to, to show some pictures from actual cases we've done in the last year or so. So uh, with that intro, I have no relevant disclosures. And here I basically kept it to two didactic slides to keep it simple, which, which as spine surgeons we like to do. The first one is, uh, uh, you know, this schematic here, you have epidural tumors, extradural tumors. The red is the tumor, the yellow is the nerves, the spinal cord is uh, outlined with uh, green, uh, green gray matter and white white matter. And then here you have an intradural but extramedullary tumor, meaning it's inside the dura, the covering of the spinal cord, but it's not in the spinal cord itself, it's just pushing on the spinal cord itself. And then you have an intradural intramedullary tumor, which means it's inside of the dura, it's inside the yellow, and it's inside the intramedullary, meaning it's inside the spinal cord itself. So that's basically the three major types of spine tumors. Um, the first one I'll talk about is intradural extramedullary. So that's this middle picture. And again, just to keep it basic, inside the dura, outside of the spinal cord, when you see that type of mass, you're thinking, meningioma, nerve sheath tumor, like a schwannoma or neurofibroma, and then more rare etiologies of these kind of tumors like medulloblastoma, leptomeningeal disease, lipoma, metastasis, all the things that we've seen, um, that we see in academic centers, but they're very, very rare on like a, a practical level. So in this corner, I just have the very, you know, always keep this basic framework in your mind. Um, epidural tumors are 55% Intradural extramedullary tumors that we're going to touch on for the first half of my talk is 40%. And then intradural intramedullary cases are more rare, and they're about 5%. So first case, there's a 60-year-old female with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, hypothyroid disease, who presents with progressive bilateral lower extremity weakness for six months on her right side more than her left side. This Presentation warranted an MRI, and she got this MRI. And uh, what this shows is a thoracic spine MRI. So you're seeing the spine from the side to orient people who uh, might not necessarily have this uh, as a familiar uh, view. We're looking from the side at a patient, so their chest is here, their back is here. There's a bone, a disc, a bone, a disc, a bone, a disc, a bone. Behind the, this is the thoracic spine, behind the, I'm pointing with my finger as if you guys could see my finger. Behind the thoracic spine, there's the gray spinal cord, which is here. You could see my mouse cursor, right, Pete? Yeah. So you can see the spinal cord, and then you also see white fluid in front and behind the spinal cord. That's the fluid that surrounds your spinal cord. And then here is the irregularity, and this is the mass uh, pushing and distorting the spinal cord from the front. So this is, you know, you can have a dorsal mass, which is behind the spinal cord, or a ventral mass, which is in front of the spinal cord. As surgeons, we'd much rather see a dorsal mass because that means as soon as we open from the back, we'll be staring at the tumor instead of having to manipulate and move the spinal cord or, you know, gently retract the spinal cord in order to remove this mass. This is just a different sequence now. This is a T2 sequence. You see the definition and the detail a little bit better. This tumor looks black on T2, and, uh, but you see this obvious uh, distortion of the spinal cord. This is a, a grainy sequence, but this right here is the tumor, and the spinal cord has been totally displaced 
uh, post here that we got a CAT scan for this patient for a few reasons, but one of them is to see how calcified this lesion is. Um, something that's less calcified, it, you know, it means it's less firm and easier to resect. So when we saw this, we were thinking this is going to be a challenging case because you could see that mass again. It's basically a, a block of calcium. So we saw the CT. We said this is going to be a, a painful and, and challenging case. Uh, hold on, I just want to make, okay, good. So this is just a brief overview. This ended up being a meningioma, and I just want to give a very, very basic overview of meningiomas. They affect females more than males with a ratio of four to one. So it's a pretty significant uh, female predominance. They're predominantly, if you look at cervical thoracic lumbar, they're predominantly thoracic. And then, you know, I mentioned that this, this tumor is, vent so there's two things that make this case challenging. Number one is that it's ventral to the spinal cord. So it's in front as opposed to behind. So the spinal cord will be in our way. And the second thing is that it's calcified. So, but how often is it, how often is it that these tumors are in front and not behind the spinal cord? In these three studies, they basically said 39%, 13%, but basically between 13 and 40% of the time they're in front of the spinal cord. So it's not that rare. So to orient you, uh, this is what we saw in surgery. So we have a midline approach. The muscles and fascia have been divided and we're looking at the spinal cord. The dura has been tacked up with these sutures. So we opened the dura and tacked the dura back. So we're staring at the spinal cord. And you may notice that over here, it looks kind of flat. And over here, it looks flat. But here, this this something elevating it and pushing it toward our view. Now we zoomed in, focused a little better, and you can see that this is the spinal cord. And it's really a beautiful, beautiful picture of the spinal cord. And then underneath, there's this mass elevating it and pushing it. So you also see a nerve coming off the side. And you see a nerve there coming off the side. Unfortunately, we had to basically do what's called a nerve sacrifice, where we have to actually, you know, divide, isolate, divide, and, and coagulate this nerve so that we can effectively remove this tumor. So that's what we did. That's the nerve sacrifice there. And then you're starting to see the tumor coming into view a little bit. You know, the origin of meningiomas are from the meninges. So they're often, the, there's some attachments to the dura, which we had to coagulate and divide, but then you start to see here that we're starting to be able to tease it out from underneath. And then when you remove the tumor, all of a sudden it gets very bloody. Um, why is it getting bloody? Because all of a sudden those veins that were tamponaded by this tumor, we remove that tumor, there's this big space and the veins just start, you know, opening up and it, and it becomes bloody. Like, you know, we had hemostasis to perfection you remove the tumor, all of a sudden you see this. And obviously you don't want to bleed inside of the dura pushing on the spinal cord. So we really had to take our time, but often this kind of venous ooze responds very well to very basic pressure and uh, foam agents that are hemostatic. So just, just to clarify for everyone that's at epidural veins that he's talking about, not intradural veins. Yep. Thank you. But we the we did the concern was that we didn't want it to pool intradurally. But thanks thanks for the clarification, Pete. And then we got a post-operative scan. And if you can, if I'll go back a few slides backward, you see this calcified lesion. We did a CAT scan after surgery just to see how things look. This the bones are missing from here to here. That was the laminectomy that we did. In the thoracic spine, you can often get away with not putting in screws and rods because you have the chest wall and the ribs to stabilize you. So you can make an argument, three level laminectomy, you could put screws and rods, but we didn't feel it was necessary and I stand by that. But you do also see the absence of this lesion, it's just gone. So at T4-5, the, the lesion was completely resected. So this patient has a very good prognosis long-term uh, with low recurrence rates. Can, can you talk about, Jeremy, why it's safe to take a nerve root in that region? Yeah, thank you. Um, so basically, um, in the, you know, you can imagine in the cervical spine or the lumbar spine, each nerve root has a muscle that it supplies. So if you were to be doing the surgery, and you're like, oh, I'll just take L4. You're going to have a foot drop after surgery. If you do it in the cervical spine, let's say I'll take C5, you'll have biceps weakness. In the thoracic spine, you know, they wrap around, they provide some sensory innervation to the chest wall and they wrap around the chest, these nerves. Um, but ultimately you don't get any motor deficit uh, when you, when you take one 
thoracic nerve root. Now there are times, and, and there's something called the artery of Ademkowitz, and if you sacrifice a nerve root, uh, particularly on the left side, particularly between T, between T10 and L2, you can actually have basically a spinal cord stroke and have a very serious motor uh, weakness. Typically around T4, you're safe. But in order to be, to be sure that by coagulating and cutting this nerve, you're not going to get an infarct to the spinal cord, we also do do, uh, we, we, t we clamp the nerve with something called a bulldog, but it's basically a clamp that goes like this. We put it across the nerve root. We wait 10 minutes. We run a motor. We make sure there's no change in the motor evoke potentials that we're monitoring, of course, during surgery to make sure there's no motor or sensory deficit. And then once we know that it's a safe nerve to take, then we can bipole, we can uh, coagulate it and cut it. So uh, in the thoracic spine, you can get away with the nerve sacrifice a lot more than in the cervical or lumbar spine, if necessary. Obviously, even though you, know, you may have a patchy, small sensory loss that most patients won't even comment or notice or complain about. Um, but despite that, of course, if you can get away without cutting the nerve, we would. But, so, but in this case, it was kind of necessary. Okay, next case, and this is my second major didactic slide. We're going to shift gears and talk about the, the 5%, the rare case, intradural, intramedullary. So now we're going to focus on here. You have a tumor that's inside your spinal canal. It's inside the dura, and it's inside the spinal cord itself. So it's uh, definitely, of the three types, the most risky uh, and most carries the most morbidity with it. So when you're thinking intradural, intramedullary, there's three basic types of tumors, ependymoma, astrocytoma, hemangioblastoma. I'm not going to get too much into depth as to what distinguishes there. There's a lot of radiographic markers, clinical markers that point us in one of the directions of which one, which one it is. Um, and then, uh, but we'll, we'll talk about the main one, which, which is what this is. And then uh, metastases is much more rare. I've seen one in my career to, to put in perspective. So the patient here is a 29-year-old female. She presented with numbness and tingling of her right upper extremity and her left upper extremity for about a year. And even just with that presentation, when you hear it's been for a year, you're starting to think this is not a metastasis. Because unfortunately, if you have a spine metastasis, it's not a slow, gradual progression. It's more of an acute thing because this is, it grows much quicker. Whereas so if you hear someone's been gradually, slowly getting worse for a year, you're not thinking something in the malignant category, you're thinking something in the benign category. So that's the way we kind of address this before the MRI gets done. Then uh, worsening symptoms, uh, gradually she started to develop fine motor coordination issues and issues with her balance. When someone has balance issues and you're thinking about the cervical spine, you know, that really points to a spinal core level issue. So if someone has a herniated disc pushing on a nerve that goes down into their arm, you may get shooting pain, you may get weakness, you may get numbness, but you won't have the balance issues. That points to spinal cord pathology. Similar with uh, dexterity issues and dropping things, that, that's, a my, that's in the myelopathy category. And again, it points to the spinal cord. So on examination, she had weakness of her inner ossei, which is uh, usually in the T1 area. Um, C71, and then she also had a, Ho a positive Hoffman's reflex. And I put a little picture of the Hoffman reflex because this is something that I will tell you that in my practice, it, it is one of the most sensitive tests we do for cervical spine pathology. And um, it really, it helps you make clinical decisions. And um, I will tell you anecdotally, we had a patient who came in with low back pain, shooting into both legs. She had M an MRI finding of L4-5 stenosis and spondylolisthesis. And then but on exam, we just picked up a Hoffman. So we said, okay, she has a Hoffman. Let's, let's get her a, an MRI of her cervical spine. And, and she ended up having an intradural intramedullary tumor in her cervical spine. So it is, I guess there's a few takeaways there. Number one is the Hoffman's reflex is an excellent, is an excellent clinical exam test. And I kind of put a little picture in the corner of how to do it when you flick the middle finger and see if the other fingers come in when you do that. But also, it's important to do a physical exam for the cervical spine, even if you have a patient coming with low back pain and lumbar spine issues. So big picture. Her MRI of the brain and cervical spine came back. She had a cervical intramedullary tumor, which is what we're going to focus on. But she also had intracranial meningiomas. So this is her brain MRI. And she had these two frontal meningiomas of the right side. She had this left parietal occipital meningioma. And she had a small uh, lesion in her CP angle consistent with likely a small acoustic schwannoma. 
Then she had her MRI of her cervical spine, which showed this. So this is a T2, T1, T1 with contrast, sagittal MRI sequence. You see on the MRI, the T2 sequence, that you have a lot of fluid changes within the spinal cord itself. The T1 shows cystic changes, and the T1 shows this is an enhancing mass inside the spinal cord itself. To orient you, this is the same view that we looked at the thoracic tumor earlier, the eyes, the nose, the mouth looking that way, looking to this way. Um, the bones of the spine, bone, disc, bone, disc, bone, disc. The spinal cord itself looking normal and gray over here, but here this is all completely irregular. It's the cord is widened. There's an enhancing mass within the cystic changes above and below because of the obstruction to normal cerebrospinal fluid flow. Um, so to put everything together, I'll open this up with the one pimping question I'll do. Does anybody, can anybody guess her syndrome to summarize? She has bilateral vestibular schwannoma. She actually, she had a unilateral vestibular schwannomas. She had a, a intracranial meningioma and a spine, spinal tumor, which ended up being an ependymoma. No pressure. Just if someone wants to shout it out, feel free. We actually had a few answers in the chat box, both of which were correct. Type two, both are correct. Excellent, excellent. So neurofibromatosis type two can have all these different things. And again, I'm gonna minimize didactics and just show cool pictures. So this is a NF2 slide and this patient did have NF2. So to summarize though, this is to go back to that sagittal picture. This is the thrust of her issue. She also does have some complication, some complicating factors. So. Uh, this is her CAT scan, and you see she actually really, you know, she has a total reversal of lordosis of her spine. So the spine, the cervical spine should be lordotic, meaning C-shaped, but here this is a reverse C. So, you know, this, this, this tumor probably led to some other changes and compensating things in her spine to, to the extent that she really had a deformity to her spine. And then, you know, we had to do a multi-level laminectomy to get this tumor out in completion. So we decided to put screws and rods in this patient. And you look on the, on, the, on the MRI also, you can see the kind of, it's called a swan neck deformity. It looks like, you know, elongated swan neck. Um, and then here's the axial cut. So the head is behind my computer, the legs are coming out this way, and we're looking at cross section up at the spinal cord. And believe it or not, the spinal cord should occupy, occupy this entire space. But all the bright enhancement here is tumor and the spinal cord was pushed over to this tiny cord of the spine in the right side. So uh, very impressive, very large. You know, this patient has an extremely high morbidity. You know, when we counsel this patient, it's not like, oh, you might do that, you know, you, but you'll be fine. This is like, you might wake up paralyzed. This is as high risk as it gets. Um, and uh, the other thing to note for this is it, you can imagine if this mass occupying this much of the spinal canal were to happen in a day, or in a week, the patient would be quadriplegic. But because this is a gradual benign tumor growth, the spinal cord can compensate, it can recruit other vessels. Um, so th that's why this patient can tolerate such a huge mass. And that's important to just remember when you're thinking benign versus malignant. A malignant tumor presenting like this would be a much more devastating injury to this patient. So on to our uh, surgery. So we did a posterior cervical laminectomy meaning we come from the back of the neck, we take off the spinous process and the lamina, and we're staring at this. So this is, the head is up here, the feet are down here, this is the left side and the right side. This is normal right here, this is a normal spinal cord. But up here you see it's just engorged and massively dilated. Um, but again, this is an intradural inside the dura, so this is the, this is the dura tacked back but it's also intramedullary. So you're not gonna see the tumor until you actually get into the spinal cord itself, which is what we did next. So we're getting meticulous hemostasis, obviously. You can actually, this is a beautiful picture of you, how you see the nerves come off of the spinal cord. It doesn't get better than that. We're getting meticulous hemostasis and then we're putting this thing in. This is called D-wave monitoring. And it's really like, uh, it's taken off in the past 10 years to the extent that it's basically almost standard of care, but certainly in an academic institution, everybody's using it for an intradural, intramedullary tumor. It's the most sensitive way to predict if you have a change in the motor evoked potential, whether that means this patient's never gonna move their arms and legs again, or if it's just swelling and retraction. So we, we use this for every intradural, intramedullary tumor at Mount Sinai. 
and this is what it looks like. It's a, it's a subdural electrode. It's, we slide it under the dura and it gives us really good information. And then now we're, we're all set up. We have a nice exposure. We got our hemostasis. We have our neuromonitoring to make sure that we're gonna have a good outcome for this patient. Now the question is, how do we get into the spinal cord to take this tumor out? And we basically have three options. There's three ways to get into the spinal cord. One is to go in the midline, and it's called the dorsal sulcus, which I'll show pictures of. The second one is through the dorsal root entry zone. That's kind of where the nerves come off, so it's more of a lateral approach. Or a transpeel, meaning you just go through the pia in the, th the thinnest portion. If, like if you see the tumor come up to the surface, you can go right over where you see the tumor breaking through the surface of the spinal cord. In this case, we did a posterior midline opening. So we coagulated in the midline of the spinal cord between the two dorsal columns, which, which is uh, proprioception, knowing where your arms and legs are in space. And you're starting to see this kind of bluish hue. And this is actually the first, the first visualization we got of the tumor itself. And now we're starting to delicately tease the tumor off of the spinal cord. And you see that, it, you know, yes, it's blue, but at times it's a, it's a little sticky and it can be very challenging to find that plane. This is a case where you obviously, you block off your entire day, you're not in a rush, you're under the microscope and you take your time. And you can see that when you get to the ventral, meaning you get around it and you're at the part in the front of the spinal cord, the spinal cord is extremely thinned out over time, but that tissue is so packed with fibers. So go back to this picture. You know, this is her spinal cord and her spinal cord, there's also a rim right around the front. And, but that, that tissue is so critical. It's, it's a millimeter, but it's her entire function that's been compensating for the slow growing tumor. So you really have to be, make sure that you don't lose, lose your plane. So finding that plane and staying in that plane is critical. And we wall it off with cottonoids as we're separating it and dividing it. And then you see, we basically got around the entire tumor. And this is as we were pulling it out. Um, and we were able to kind of find the plane, dissect around it in all planes and remove it. And this is what it looks like. And you see how thin the spinal cord is. And it's just this case to me, I mean, I couldn't believe how thinned out her cord is and how she wasn't how she was still able to move her arms and legs with it with a, you know a millimeter of spinal cord left but she did great and then we did this closure this is um you know we use like a 60 gore tex it's a tiny needle a little thicker than a hair and it takes us about 30 minutes to get it closed but you don't want any cerebrospinal fluid to leak out through the dura so we took our time and we did a nice closure and she actually did Extremely well. So we did a C4 to T1 laminectomy, resection of intradural intramedullary tumor, C3 to T2 instrumentation and fusion. This is the post-operative MRI. You see that there's no uh, tumor left. There was still the cystic component left. To get an MRI now would be a completely academic exercise because thankfully she, she took a, a little hit. So she got, I would say, a little worse with surgery, but with about three months of rehab, she's about nine months out now. And she is um, doing incredibly well, and she's back to her baseline. So there's really no reason to get an MRI right now. But I would be curious to see if that if those cystic changes have resolved and what her spinal cord looks like now. But she did very well. This is uh, again, she had that deformity, and you see that we basically were able to correct it. And now it's I wouldn't call it a normal C-shaped lordosis to the cervical spine, but we definitely were able to correct some of that swan neck deformity. So. Um, I'm kind of, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this for the sake of time, uh, because I do want to get to Caridi's talk. But let, let, let's talk a little bit about intramedullary spinal cord tumors. They make up about 3% of all central nervous system tumors in adults. They account for 15% of all primary intradural spinal cord tumors. The most common one is an ependymoma, which is what this case was. In children, it's an astrocytoma. Appendomoma, which again, this case was commonly cervical or upper thoracic, average age is 45, they're slow growing. So again, they can get very large before they're clinically detected. Symptoms precede discovery on average by two years, meaning someone's gradually saying, oh, I have a little tingling in my arms, I'm having a little balance issues. But it, on average, it takes two years to diagnose a patient with uh, this. So it's pretty amazing how subtle and gradual uh, the clinical findings are. They often have a red, gray, or blue color. They get their vascular supply from the anterior spinal artery. Um, they're usually, this is important, they're usually in the, in the center of the spinal cord, and that's because ependymomas, they're called ependymomas because they arise from ependymal cells. 
um, and that's and the Panama cells are in the center of the spinal cord. Um, they usually enhance vividly and, and uh, homogeneously. And you know, prognosis-wise, if they're removed completely, there's a very good prognosis. Um, uh, the 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 problem is you can't always get a complete resection, but when you do, the patients have very good prognoses. And uh, uh, even though this patient was young, I I would think she would have a, a long-standing. Um, clearance. That said, we will image her at one year after surgery to make sure there's no recurrence. Um, what There's not really a right answer here. What I would do is I would image her in one year after surgery, make sure there's no recurrence. Then I would do one year again. Then I would do two years. And then I'd probably, uh, if there's no recurrence at all and no sign of recurrence, I'd probably space it out even further after that. And then of course, you always say and document or sooner if symptoms progress. So obviously, if she has shooting pain or numbness or tingling or difficulty with balance, you would of course bring her in and get an MRI sooner. The most important factor predicting recurrence is an incomplete resection. But as you can see, sometimes you do have to leave tumor if it's very stuck and your choices do a complete resection or give the patient a ne neurologic deficit, you know, you, you can leave tumor behind if you absolutely have to. So in conclusion, intradural surgery is, uh, for intradural tumors is elegant and beautiful, but I find it extremely stressful. And it's definitely a case that you wanna block off time not rush and uh, do a great job for the best uh, possible clinical outcome. And that brings me to Karidi's talk. Uh, I was supposed to talk for 30 minutes. I'll give myself some credit because that was pretty good. Uh, I'm happy to open the floor for some questions here while we shift gears and I'll pull up my next talk in the meantime. We actually had a question about um, whether there's a risk for intracranial hypotension from all the drainage of CSF for these and whether there's anything you do to manage that. Hold on one second. This is John's talk. You can still hear me, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, great question. Um, I've never seen it. Um, the reason being is that once we open, we basically, uh, we wall off both sides. So we're not like kind of consistent, consistently uh, leaking CSF the entire case. Um, if that was a concern, you could talk about doing a um, lumbar drain or something like that. But I, I would say that's something I've never seen before, mainly because we wall off the air, the, like both sides. And also, uh, usually if the CSF is running low, it just won't keep oozing out. Like I, I think we do lose a fair amount of CSF, but then it just, it kind of balances itself and doesn't keep oozing out like it's a pressure-based leakage so once the pressure is gone it's not going to leak as much the other thing to remember is the patient's prone and what before we close we irrigate and fill up the space and then close so then when they're getting back up upright hours later they're already regenerating that csf pressure um let's see is there a risk of ischemic injury or fibrosis while suturing the hmm. I'm not sure I understand this question, actually. Well, I'll answer the ischemic injury. Um, oh, while suturing the dorsal segment, I think he means, uh, he or she means, uh, um, like when you suture the, the we, don't, we actually don't suture the dura closed. The spinal cord, you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, the spinal cord closed. We just, we make that dorsal opening in the dorsal sulcus, and, and, that's, and then that's it. You know, we don't, we don't put it back together again. Um, but the, the idea is, and I, I thought I had slides on this, I guess I didn't put them in, but the dorsal sulcus is really, it doesn't have, as long as you stay there, it's a visible groove. As long as you stay right in the center and, and you go in carefully and you, you don't retract too aggressively. I mean, the nucleus gracilis and nucleus uh, cuneatus, which you guys have learned about more recently than I have, um, is right there. We're literally looking at it. Um, so if you retract on that too much, you know, you cause a severe proprioceptive deficit. And that's actually, I think what I've learned over the years is proprioceptive deficit deficits are, they're, they're horrible. And I've, I've also heard this, like, you know, cause we work with physical therapists and occupational therapists, not knowing where your limbs are and trying to walk or trying to coordinate your movements of your arms is just, uh, it's really a devastating injury. And this patient did have that for a short time, but she, she really, again, thankfully made a really good recovery. Um, one about NF. Um, this is a, I mean, this is a tough one. I think both of us can answer this, but it's mostly about 
what's progressing and what's causing a deficit because these patients have hundreds of tumors. And so you can't just, you can't just take them all out. You have to be very careful because it's a lifelong disease. 100% agree. I have a patient who I'm following who has nine spinal cord tumors. And, uh, but right now he's, you know, minimally symptomatic and we're just watching him and we're basically going to take him out as they become symptomatic. Um, so if he starts getting a foot drop, of course, we're going to go in there. But if, if he's, if he's asymptomatic, we're just going to watch them. We're, we're going to, and him, because he has so many, we're getting annual scans. And if it's a tough disease, the hope is that, uh, some, one of these new generation targeted inhibitors will begin to make an impact for these patients. All right. You want to go on? Let's do it. So I apologize um, for John Caridi's absence. Uh, he's in a case and uh, he asked me, he just emailed me his slides. Um, John Caridi is one of the busiest spine surgeons in the tri-state area and he has done so many metastases that he's really a guy who I would have loved for you to hear from him. But I'm sure he, by putting together these slides, uh, he will have imparted some of his wisdom. So surgical management of spine metastases, um, 30 to 90% of patients with systemic cancer um, can get spinal metastases. Um, it affects males more than females. The average age is 40 to 65, and only 20% become symptomatic. So I, I will, I'll jump in here, and I just wrote an uh, article, a true demonstration of, of nice, like, uh, multidisciplinary. We, we wrote the paper with myself, a neuroradiologist, and a, and a radiation oncologist. So it was really nice to kind of put a paper together with everybody. And it, but that really is the way to deal, to take a step back, the way to deal with spine metastases is to get everybody involved multidisciplinary because the, the paradigm has shifted. A lot of the work from Mark Bilski and the Sloan Kettering group, I mean, what we used to do is not what, 10 years ago is not what we do anymore for spine surgery. So we're doing a lot of separation surgery because radiation has gotten so good that you can just separate the tumor from the spinal cord and they'll radiate the rest and, and, and get it to go away depending on what kind of tumor it is. So... Um, it is important to really just stay up to date and also get multidisciplinary care with oncology, radiation oncology, neuroradiology, you know, uh, IR, you know, there's so many teams that play a role in, in spine metastases. The most common location is thoracic, um, 70%, T4 to 7 being the most common. 50% um, involve multiple levels. The anterior vertebral body is involved in the majority of cases. This is really important because you talk about a challenge in, in spine metastasis surgery. Getting around the spinal cord in the thoracic spine is not an easy thing to do because you can't retract the spinal cord. You have to work around it. So you have to sometimes you have to take out an entire pedicle, which is the strongest part of the vertebrae to get in front. Or sometimes you have to do a really wide decompression. And then you start talking about putting in screws and rods and doing these big aggressive surgery, but these patients are often very sick and they have radiation they need to get to. So it's, they're on chemotherapy. So that again, just, I can't stress it enough how this is a multidisciplinary disease. The most common primary tumors, lung, prostate, breast, renal, and then multiple myeloma, plasma cytoma. Palliative goals of therapy. I don't know if that's a mislabeling of this slide, um, but uh, Basically, the things that we're focusing on in, in discussing surgery for spine metastases, neurologic function. Somebody who comes in and they're weak in both legs is going to be a very different discussion than somebody who comes in with mild pain and you happen to find a metastasis at T6. I think he's writing that um, you're not curing their cancer with the spine metastasis. So everything you do is palliative. Right. Oh, I see. That's what he was saying. Yeah, that's, that's probably what he was getting at. Yes, exactly. And it's important to have a little humility. I think, I think the times I've seen spine surgery go wrong, it's when people think like, oh, let me get every last bit of tumor and the surgery's 15 hours and you lose four liters of blood. That's not the right thing for the patient. Spinal stability. So this is really important when you're assessing a patient. Are they unstable? Because when you're unstable, it's a whole different treatment paradigm that involves screws and rods and potentially cement augmentation. Um, how do you know if someone's unstable? A lot of the, a lot of the, um, a lot of the decision making is listening to the patient. You know, pain on on uh, on lying flat. You know, I've had patients who literally can't lie down in a bed, and that's that's related to the instability, um, mechanical pain, and not being able to walk a block. Uh, we could do flexion extension X-rays. So, but it is important to know whether the patient's unstable. 
also a lot of it is radiographic. So if someone has three columns, meaning the anterior, middle, and posterior column of the spine are involved, and there's like greater than 50% collapse of the vertebral body, then you can kind of infer some of it by radiographic finding whether they're unstable or not. Uh, you definitely want to help their pain. Uh, we just did a T10 to L3 fusion for someone who literally couldn't walk, couldn't get out of bed. And uh, we just, you know, quick, get him on the table, get him off the table, decompress and stabilize his spine as, as, as much as possible so that he could live his life. I mean, the goal was to get his pain to, not to eliminate it because that's unrealistic. He had spine, he had, he, his spine was riddled with spine tumors, um, but it was just to get, you know, get him enough control to live his life for, for the duration of his life. Uh, but but uh, to touch on duration of life, we often do get a prognosis from oncology because if someone has three weeks to live, we're not going to take them for a big um, posterior spinal surgery. Um, it has to be a discussion with the family. It has to be a discussion with oncology, and it, you have to do the right thing by the patient. Um, local tumor control. Um, again, uh, this I touched on already, but with um, external beam radi radiotherapy and uh, and SRS, stereotactic radio surgery, we are, we have to be a little, it's kind of like, you know, someone taking out a one centimeter acoustic neuroma, which we were doing 20 years ago, you have to recognize now that with the radiation change and how good the radi radiation oncologists are getting, we have to change our paradigm too. That's definitely affecting spine surgery. So options for therapy, so good. So John, John's saying the same thing I did, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary. Um, this is an important slide because it talks about how the treatment has evolved over time. And we touched on that a little bit already, but in 1971, it started, evidence started coming out that radiation was superior to surgery. And, but at that point, the surgical options were limited to a laminectomy. Then as uh, in 1979, radi radiation should be the primary mode of treatment. Surgery should be reserved for a situation in which radiotherapy fails. This is 1979, but we're getting a lot more high tech and we're getting a lot more uh, clever in the way we're, we're approaching these. Um, so I think this is Patchell's study. Yeah, Patchell. So this is, this is probably the most significant. If there's one paper to know in spine surgery, as, as a spine surgeon for, for spine metastases, it was, it was the Patchell's paradigm um, because that showed, uh, oh, he, he doesn't have the summary, but basically that, that basically showed that surgery uh, decompressive surgery, the outcomes were actually better um, for the right patient uh, on, on long-term follow-up. It was, it was probably the best done study to date. And it, and it, it kind of, sorry, my screen is acting up right now. Okay, I'm back. And I, you can hear me, right, Pete? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so this was a surgery where, uh, I, I don't have the, the results here, but this was a game changer for spine metastases and understanding the role of when we, we need to do surgery versus radiation. The other thing is, you know, we don't know, uh, I, I mean, I mean we, we, we have since learned which tumors respond very well to radiation and which ones are more, you know, which ones are radio sensitive, which ones are radio resistant. And obviously that's a massive, uh, difference, you know, non-small cell versus small cell, your decision is often based on the histology and knowing which, which it is and which, who needs surgery and who doesn't. Um, I think John maybe switched here and showed some uh, cases. So let's hope he has his post-ops. I think he's showing uh, maybe how aggressive spine surgery used to be in this slide. Um, okay, this, uh, sorry, these are, these are not my slides again. So basically, um, this is the gnomes criteria and I'm sorry, my screen is acting up again. Okay. So this is the gnomes criteria and this basically focuses us on four areas and it helps us make surgical decision, surgical decisions. So N O M S gnomes N is neurologic. What is their neuro status? Do they have myelopathy? Do they have radiculopathy? What is their degree of epidural spinal cord compression, which is a whole separate scale? Oncologic, what is the burden of their oncology? 
what is their tumor histology that goes on going back to non-small cell versus small cell and what's radiosensitive and radioresistant. Uh, chemosensitivity. So, you know, one thing I didn't touch on yet is chemotherapy. Some, some tumors respond very well to chemotherapy. Instability, we touched on already, and there's a whole separate scale called the SIN score. I'm sure John has it in an upcoming slide, but you need to know if the patient's unstable because that, that changes the paradigm. And then S, systemic disease. This goes back to, do they have three weeks to live or do they have two years to live? Because that's going to be a very different plan for that patient. And Oh, and by the way, Palliative care, I, I didn't mention that in the multidisciplinary approach, but that is 100% critical uh, for someone to help them you know, cope and help make decisions. Um, this is that scale I was telling you about, the epidural spinal cord compression scale. So there's three types going from minimal compression of the spinal cord to severe compression of the spinal cord. So here you see that's the spinal cord there, surrounded on all sides by the tumor. And this was uh, one of the main works done by Bilski at uh, Sloan Kettering, which was critical. But you can hear, you know, you can see here it's basically abutting but not really indenting the spinal cord. Here it's circumferential around the spinal cord with compression, and then here it's gross spinal cord compression. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. This is this is a critical slide that divides the tumors into radio sensitive and radio resistant. So you can imagine somebody who has melanoma, for example, which is historically very radio resistant. You can't radiate that, that tumor. And that said, I will say in 10 years, this slide is gonna look different. So it is, it's important to recognize that, um, but this is, because uh, radiation just keeps getting better and better. But as of now, if you have one of this box here, that's gonna push you more to surgery. Other versus if, they're, if it's a radiosensitive lesion. And just to add one thing to this slide, breast is a little more complicated, and there is certain breast tumors that are, breast metastases that are radio resistant. Um, and this is a great summary slide of the GNOMES criteria and decision-making. So if you have a radiosensitive tumor, you're gonna try to radiate that patient. If you have a radio resistant tumor, but there's low grade spinal cord compression, you could do stereotactic radio surgery, excuse me. But if it's high grade spinal cord compression and it's a radio resistant tumor, you can do surgery followed by SRS. I will add this, of course, the way the patient presents is extremely relevant. So if someone comes in with cauda equina syndrome for two hours, that's very different than someone complaining of back pain. So of course, you might be pushed into surgery with someone who has cauda equina syndrome, whereas, you know, so that, that has to be factored in to this paradigm also. Um, I think he's showing some examples of his own patients. Uh, this is a lesion with multiple myeloma with pretty impressive spinal cord compression, but you see here with a lesion like multiple myeloma, you can get away with radiation. And of course, our goal is not to operate if we can. And this is the clinical follow-up where they have basically complete resolution. This, this tumor melts away with radiation pretty dramatically. Um, here's an example of a renal metastasis that was radio resistant and it looks like they did surgery followed by SRS and then there's their follow-up. Um, number of months, incidence, SRS. I think this is showing the, the dramatic improvements you can get with SRS. Sorry, I didn't have time to review these slides. I got out of the order myself a little late. Um, I think he's giving some of his own cases of examples. So again, separation surgery nowadays, you know, our goal is just to take the spinal cord compression away so that they could radiate so that the patient could get better, minimizing the surgical risks. Um, this is a 38-year-old female who had a diff dedifferentiated liposarcoma. This is a radio-resistant lesion, impressive spinal cord compression dorsally, and you see the spinal cord pushed forward and to the left side. So I think what John's getting at here is he removed this tumor here and that's it. He just made room for the spinal cord. He didn't go after this. He didn't go after the lamina. He didn't take out the pedicle. He just did separation surgery. And here you see um, him separating the tumor off of the spinal cord.
And here you see the CT myelogram that was done after surgery showing there's no more spinal cord compression. And then this was followed by 2400 gray, which is how they describe the radiation doses in three fractions. Um, I don't wanna to get too much into slides that are not my own because I don't wanna bore you guys. Uh, vascular, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this. So a major issue for someone who's gonna have radiation after spine surgery is wound issues. Because if you radiate, you're killing the cells that are in the pathway of the radiation and that predisposes the wound to break down. These patients often are on chemotherapy, radiation, they're, you know, they're white counts out of whack and they're getting radiation. So there's a huge wound breakdown issue um, with spine surgery followed by radiation. So we started doing vascularized flaps and we do this at Sinai pretty frequently now. We get plastic surgeons involved and they're gonna basically cover our hardware with these vascularized flaps so there's less likely wound issues down the road because there's, no, there's a really aggressive muscle closure over, over the hardware. And um, I personally, I'm not a big plastic surgeon guy for closure. Um, but on, on spine metastases, I do always, always call a plastic surgeon. Um, instability. Yeah, here, good. This is great. So this is the SIN score. This is critical for decision making. So this is the SIN scale right here. And it looks at these six factors. So there's location. Certain locations, you're going to be more unstable. For example, at the occiput junction with your cervical spine, any junction, so where the spine, the cervical meets the thoracic, thoracic meets the lumbar, lumbar meets the sacrum, that's going to be a more uh, predisposed to instability level. So the level matters. The pain, do they have pain? Do they have mechanical pain? If they have mechanical pain, classic mechanical pain, that gives them three points. And this is, you know, I'll, I'll talk about scales in a second. Is it a lytic versus a blastic lesion? Lytic, often the bone is eroded, and that will make it a little more unstable. Blastic, you just get this kind of mega strong bone from, bla from osteoblastic cells, so then it's less likely to be unstable. A radiographic spinal line, this we, we touched on earlier, but of course the, the, the CT and MRI findings, if there's subluxation, that patient's unstable. If they have a deformity, that, that's gonna push you to, to, to think on instability. Normal alignment, obviously, you get no points. Vertebral collapse, we touched on this earlier also. Greater than 50% collapse, you get a lot of points because that means that they're likely to be unstable. And then the posterolateral involvement of the spinal elements, meaning is the pedicle involved? Is it involved on one side, on both sides? If it's bilateral, that's going to be a lot of points. If you get a score in the 13 to 18 category, that patient's unstable. They need an aggressive uh, surgery, meaning maybe two up or and two down, meaning if you have a T6 lesion, you're gonna do T4, T5, T7, T8, screws and rods. I will talk qu quickly about scales, you know, like on a practical level, it, they're very helpful. So it's important to calculate these for your patients, but, but I will say not every patient follows um, this, this uh, paradigm. For example, let's say you have a 96 year old and they have an unstable score of 13, the right thing for that patient might be, you know, conservative management and the kyphoplasty or something like that. So keep that in mind. Percutaneous stabilization. This is definitely a topic that's near and dear to my heart because I think that when you have instability at one segment, you can often do a very small and minimally invasive approach. So this is someone who it looks like they had minimally invasive percutaneous screws. So you make these tiny little incisions, maybe 18 millimeters. You make four little stab incisions. You put in four screws takes an hour and a half and you've stabilized this patient, but you didn't open up their spine. You didn't move their muscles off their spine and predispose them to breakdown and issues and plastic surgery, et cetera. So I, I think that there's definitely a role for minimally invasive in spine metastases. Not always, of course, certain of some of the cases John had in the slides earlier, um, you know, th those are not patients you could get away with a minimally invasive approach, but for the right patient, it's a home run surgery and they'll benefit. And that is where we'll end. So I leave some time for questions and sorry, those were not my slides at the end, but. I just want to throw in a comment just to, related to, uh, as I was watching you go through John's slides, I want to contextualize one thing for them. So gnomes is a big picture way of looking at the, the, the whole patient with a spinal metastasis. So you look at their neurologic status, their 
oncologic, so what kind of tumor they have, their mechanical score, which is where SINS comes in, and then their systemic disease. And so you use all of those components to make a decision about whether the patient needs surgery and what kind that they need. Um, so SINS is not a, a standalone scale, as Dr. Steinberger was commenting. It fits into this framework of deciding, do they have a deficit? Do they have a radioresistant tumor? Do they have a very aggressive tumor? Do they have severe extensive systemic disease that, that lowers their life expectancy? Do they have mechanical instability? So all of those pieces form the puzzle of gnomes that helps you decide what to recommend for each patient. Looks like there's one question I'm happy to answer. It says uh, from uh, Archis, for open cases, eight cases, could you discuss how you decide how many levels wide to make a laminectomy based on tumor size? And it's an, ex and it's an excellent question. So, uh, and it's a little complicated to get into in a quick answer, but, but briefly, um, how wide to make the laminectomy depends on where the tumor is. So if it's a central dorsal epidural metastasis, that doesn't get easier for us. We go in, we take off the spinous process, do a thin laminectomy, keep it small, remove the tumor. But often they're off to one side. So they're, let's say they're, you know, on, if they extend basically under the facet, under the, where the two bones articulate with each other, that really makes it a lot more challenging. Because if you want to, if you have to take, you know, again, we, we talked about separation surgery, but if you're trying to take the whole tumor out and you have to take off the facet where the two bones articulate and you're in the lumbar spine, if you start taking away facet and you destabilize the patient, that's when you start talking about screws and rods. And, and it, it's a, but, um, so as far as how wide the laminectomy is, it really is depends on how big the tumor is, where it goes, is it on one side, both sides, is it, does it involve the facet, does it go into the vertebral body itself? Um, and then as far as putting in screws, so this is, you know, it depends on the patient's bone quality, the patient's age, the patient's morbidities. I would say not a rule, but what we typically follow is for someone with a grossly unstable lesion of their spinal cord, we usually do two up and two down. So uh, that's kind of been shown to be a good balance of not doing too much, not doing too little. If someone has horrendous bone quality or tumor involved in some of those bones above, we might do three up, three down. If someone has excellent bone quality, we might get away with one up, one down. As you saw in one of those pictures at the end, they were able to do that. So it really depends on a lot of factors. I think the goal is always to do as little as possible to help the patient for a spine metastasis patient. Do you um, add levels above or below for junctional regions, or is that not a thing? Yeah, let's give an example of, let's say, a T11, uh, T12. Basically, no, because if you're doing two up, two down, I think I'll, I would, but here, here's an example, L3. So if you do, if someone has an L3 tumor and bad quality bone, you decide you're going to go two up, two down, you do L1 to L5. A lot of people would cross the junction and go to T12 because stopping at a junctional segment is predisposing the patient to break down. Um, that, I mean, I would say that you're not, that patient is predisposed to break down more so than somebody who's ending in the middle of a segment. So, uh, you know, that said, I've done it. I've done L1 to L5 fusions. You know, we try to preserve the osteoligamentous complex, meaning like we're going to try not to disrupt their ligaments and keep their muscles there and, and not disrupt the joint above to, to lower that risk of them breaking down. Um, but uh, it, it's, a fact, it's, a, it's a factor in the decision-making, I would say. There's um, a question about whether radiation necrosis is a concern in the spinal cord. You want to take that one? Yeah, um, absolutely it is. Um, less so than in the brain. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of blanking on a good answer for why that is. Uh, but uh, I've seen it, but it's much more rare. We don't see it as much. Yeah, I think a big part of it is because we've moved towards separation surgery and SRS. And so we, there, there's, there's almost no dose going to the spinal cord. Like they treat the spinal cord like a protected um, site. So for radiation, we, we allow the hemispheres to get radiation dose when we radiate tumors we don't allow the optic nerves or the pituitary gland or the brainstem to get radiation dose. And as a result, we often don't get radiation necrosis in those areas. Same is true for the spinal cord. It's a privileged environment. That's a great answer. I will say that somebody, I just got a consult um, 
for a patient who was transferred from a kind of a, a small hospital. And the, the reason they were, there's a patient with metast- a physician who had metastatic breast cancer. And she was transferred. The reason that they stated was because she had, they didn't feel comfortable doing thoracic disc herniations. So we brought the patient over and, you know, talk about the importance of a clinical exam. She didn't really have like a thoracic syndrome. She had more of a lumbar syndrome. So we got her an MRI plus minus of her lumbar spine and she had diffuse leptomeningeal disease. Um, and unfortunately that, that, that carries a pretty poor prognosis without any treatment. It's two to four weeks. So it's a very serious, uh, once the, the, tumor spreads to the intradural space and the leptomeninges, it's very serious. With radiation now and um, aggressive radiation and treatment, you, you, I think their lifespan is two to four months. So it's, it's longer, but it's still a hard, it was a really horrible conversation to have with that patient. But um, so in that case, I mean, you could think about radiation necrosis, but unfortunately in that, in that patient, you know, there's, it's unlikely to become an issue in their lifetime. Can you also talk about um, decisions to um, to use cement augmentation for screws? Uh, um, that's that's like a like a, a patient specific question. I think these patients often are a little older. They're often a little sicker. Their bone quality is a little poor. Nowadays, it's relatively easy to inject cement. Um, you know, you basically have these screws that are called fenestrated. They have a scroll, uh, they have a scroll, they have a, a hole going through the center of the screw. So you put your screw in and then you inject the cement through. Now I will say I've seen two complications over the years um, of patients who had cement extravasation. So if, the, if, if let's say you put in a screw, but it's not good and you revise it and you, and then you're ready and then you put the cement in, but it follows the tract of a prior screw attempt that screw, that, that cement can go where it shouldn't be, like into the canal, the spinal canal, or into the neural foramen. Uh, and if that happens, it's extremely difficult, you can imagine, to, get, to take cement out of, the, out of the spinal cord, out of the epidural space or the neural foramen. So what I say, what I personally do is if I have any issue getting that screw in the first time around, I will not use cement. But otherwise, I, I'm using cement when it's uh, a patient who has poor quality bone. And uh, the, a great question, you know, that, that's what kind of I was touching on. I, I wasn't eloquent in the way I described it, but when I was saying about these scales, these scales are critical because they're, they're critical because they help you think about the disease process and make decisions. It's less to me about calculating a score. It's thinking about all the relevant things to make a decision. So I would say that patchel and gnomes, you know, there might be like one, a rare circumstance where like the patchel saying to do surgery and gnomes is saying not to, I think that's kind of like if you see 10 different spine surgeons, you might get 10 different opinions because there's an aggressiveness scale and how aggressive are you going to be, which is why it goes back to doing the minimal possible to help the patient without underdoing it and doing too little. So that, that's the balance. And I, I will say this, as, as today demonstrated, I had really five complicated patients today. And it's like, I, I think the easiest part of neurosurgery is the surgery. The decision making is often the hardest part and what to do and how much to how aggressive to be. Maybe that's a good place to end it. I think so. Um, Thank you, Dr. Steinberger, for your time tonight. Uh, This was great. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, On Thursday, we're gonna have a session with um, Dr. Hajapanias and myself uh, talking about preparing for virtual interviews and trying to get the most out of a, an interesting interview season. Uh, obviously, we're doing this for the first time too, but we hope that our um, our suggestions and insights and answering your questions will help you along in the process. So yeah, thanks everyone. Have a great night. Good night.